Hello class and welcome to lesson two. I'm excited to dive into more of the content we have for this class and continue to learn together. I really enjoy reading your discussion board posts and working with you, so I'm excited that we just get to keep going here and uh, go a little bit deeper this time after having so much introductory material in the first lesson. So this second lesson is on critical reading, which is going to build off of what we learned in the first lesson. If you recall real quickly, in the first lesson, we talked extensively about rhetoric and how rhetoric is really the study and effective use of communication. So by studying rhetoric and how authors and creators persuade people to think differently, we'll learn more about how to become effective communicators and, and subsequently persuade people ourselves. If that is the goal for the class, then critical reading is arguably the most essential thing to learn after learning about rhetoric. You could say that critical reading is one of the most fundamental aspects of rhetoric. Because to understand how others are trying to persuade you and then to persuade others yourself, you have to really dig deep when you're reading any kind of text. In this particular lesson, because it's our introduction to critical reading, we're going to look specifically at written text. And I've got three examples of that I've asked you to do to read for the required reading for this lesson. But some in this lesson and more throughout the quarter will talk about how critical reading, as we understand the concept, does not apply just to written text, but also to visual media. And we'll get a little bit of that here, but we're really, in later lessons, going to expand the concept and learn how to read visual text and audio text and all types of text critically. So this lesson will be broken into two parts. Um, the first part will be uh, understanding of critical reading. What is it and how do we do it? And then the second part will be an example, so a critical reading of Sam Anderson's article, Just One More Game. I have assigned three articles for you to read for this lesson. The first one is going to be like my example. I'm going to take you through a critical reading of this article to apply the skills we learn in part one of the lecture. But I'm not really going to discuss the other two articles in the lecture, and that's very intentional on my part. I want you to take the skills you learn by listening to this lecture and seeing me use them to analyze Anderson's article and then use those skills yourself to analyze the other two articles for your discussion board, uh, which will be a strategy I use in my teaching throughout the class is teaching and demonstrating a skill in the lecture and then seeing you apply that skill yourself to other examples. Um, and by giving you other examples to apply the skills to and not going over those examples in detail in the lectures really creates an opportunity for you to demonstrate to me that you've learned this skill. Um, but it's certainly not the only opportunity. So if you feel like you haven't, you know, mastered critical reading by the end of this lecture, don't worry. Um, that's not the goal. Um, I structure my classes in a way so that all of the assignments build on each other and that you're continuing to develop the skills such as rhetorical sensitivity, lesson one, and critical reading, this lesson, throughout the quarter. So in later discussion posts, we'll revisit the same skills and most importantly in the papers you write, you'll, you'll need to do rhetorical analysis and you'll need to do critical reading to have success in the papers. So this will be a, a good introduction to critical reading, but you'll have plenty of more examples throughout the quarter, plenty more opportunities, excuse me, to demonstrate that you've learned this skill. So what is critical reading and how do you do it? Um, I picked this image here because I think it really shows some important key differences between critical and non-critical reading. I think the most important thing to understand at first is that when you read something, there's not just one way to read things. And so what are the differences? I think the most important 
difference here is the first one listed, that critical reading is active rather than passive. If you think about those words and what they mean in other contexts and then apply that understanding to reading, the definition of critical reading becomes very clear. So if you have to make a decision and you say, well, you know, I don't really care. Like your your friends say to you, what movie should we see or where should we go for dinner? And you say, ah, it doesn't matter to me. That's being passive, right? But if you say, I would really like to go to Zips because I think they have the best food and it's worth spending a little bit more money than going to McDonald's, there you're being very active. So non-critical reading would just be reading without really engaging with the material, whereas critical reading would be engaging, thinking about what the material is saying, whether you agree or not, having a purpose while you read. Um, for instance, we might use critical reading not necessarily all of the time, but in, in different examples. So uh, I read all kinds of different things, and I, I like to read, as I mentioned in lecture one, um, articles about the NFL because I love football. You know, I'm not necessarily doing critical reading when I read those, but when I read all kinds of other things, like a lot of the articles I assigned for this class, I, I'm taking a more active, engaged role in my reading. Um, non-critical reading really leads you to at most just summary. Like if you ask me what an NFL article is about, I would say, here's what the writer said. Um, but a more critical reading, I would answer questions like what, how, why. Um, the what is just the facts and the how and the why go beyond that. So why did this person write the article and how did they do how did they try to achieve that purpose or that goal? Kind of like rhetorical analysis. Um, Non-critical reading, um, it's not necessarily that you're gullible, but more so that you're not reading um, with a skeptical eye. And, and skeptical, I mean, you don't just believe things right away. You don't just take everything the article or the piece you're reading says um, for granted, you think, well, well, maybe I don't believe this, and here's why. And then finally, critical reading, you have a purpose when you read critically. There's a goal. I'm reading this because. And having a goal, I think, <clears throat> the first thing here and the last thing are related. Having a goal when you read, having a purpose, makes the reading active. Now, you might be asking, why do critical reading? I said a few things earlier, like it's one of the most fundamental, important skills to learn uh, when starting out in college, which is part of why we cover an English 101. More importantly, it's, it's fundamental to rhetoric, to understanding how people are communicating with you and growing as a communicator yourself, trying to create change. Uh, but I would just like, before we move on, to add one more reason why we do critical reading. Like I said before in, in lesson one, I think I had this graphic in lesson one, but reading and writing, Sarah, a symbiotic, actually really even more so a cyclical relationship. So there's numerous, like dozens, maybe even hundreds of studies out there that show really active, engaged reading makes one a better writer and really working on your writing, trying to become a better writer makes one a better reader. And so this class is, is mainly about writing. It's a composition class, but this graphic shows why reading is a fundamental part of a writing class. It's really when it's called composition, people think it's a writing class, but it really has to be like 50% reading in order for students to improve in their writing because of what this graphic reflects. Um, <clears throat> which in my own experience and, and over a decade of working with students, um, that experience as well, I really believe this, this statement is true. And lastly, I'll just add kind of deepening what I said earlier about it being a fundamental skill to learn in college. Um, as you take other classes and other departments, maybe even for your major, you're going to have to do a lot of reading. So, so be in reading dense um, text that may not be uh, readily accessible. 
So learning these skills and honing them in English 101 and 201 can really help you thrive in other classes. <clears throat> so hopefully now we know what critical reading is. Let's talk about how you actually do it. Um, so here are some strategies. And then in part two of the lecture, I'm actually going to take the Anderson article and do these strategies, show them to you, like demonstrate them. So first is adjusting your reading speed. Like I said earlier, one of the main points of this lecture, kind of fundamental to buying into the idea of critical reading, if you buy into it, is the idea that there's more than one way to read something. And so likewise, there's more than one speed at which to read something. Now this becomes really important, right? I can read an article about the NFL super quickly. And I should say there's a lot of really good in-depth, hard-hitting articles about the NFL that one can read critically. And I've brought those into class before, but I'm talking about just knowing who is injured or not on my favorite team, right? I can read that super fast. <clears throat> but like the articles I teach in this class, you know, when I chose them, I read a lot of articles to decide which are the best ones. If I read those at the same speed as I try to figure out who's injured on my favorite team, I would not understand them. I would not have good reading comprehension of them. And so for the more challenging things, especially when you're reading critically, you want to go more slowly. Annotating. Um, I could put these statistics on the, on the screen like I did for the relationship between reading and writing, but kind of just applying that at another level, writing while you read. So there's tons of studies out there, again, dozens or hundreds that show <clears throat> you remember something better if you write it down while you read it. <clears throat> and it can be great to go back and look at your notes, but just the act of writing something down, even if you never look at it again, will help you remember it better than if you don't write anything. So keep that pen busy in the margins. And even if you're reading, if you don't print the articles out, if you're reading them just on a screen, you can make notes in like a Word document or on a piece of paper while you're reading, um, you know, whatever's best, but write things down while you read. Now we get into, those are two activities you can actually do while reading. With these next bullet points, we get more into what would go on mentally, <clears throat> what you would think about <clears throat> after you read or, or as you read, but really more the analysis and reflection part of it. So the first level of thinking here is summarizing, but in your own words. So here you're not giving any kind of commentary, not giving your opinion, um, because that comes later in the process but being able to say what the article said in your own words. And that's the key term because we can quote all day long, but quoting doesn't demonstrate any knowledge. I can say something to you that's a quote and have no idea what it means. But if I take that quote or that idea encapsulated by the quote and explain what it means in my own words, <clears throat> then I demonstrate that I've truly understood it. And this is really important. When you write your papers for the classes, for our class, I mean, you're welcome to quote, but I don't recommend quoting extensively, especially when you're citing research. I, I want to see that you've understood what you read. So a lot more paraphrasing than quoting will really demonstrate your knowledge um, better than just quoting. The next step after summarizing is analysis. So what does it mean? Why is it important going a little bit deeper? And there's some specific ways to do those. The first would be identifying the rhetorical situation. So here's a more obviously direct link to our first lesson on rhetoric, but all of those things we went over last time, like what is the rhetorical situation? What is the author's purpose or goal? Who is their audience? How do they try to achieve that goal? Do they successfully achieve it or not? How do they use um, ethos or credibility, pathos or emotion? 
logos or logical reasoning and kairos or timeliness to achieve their purpose to persuade their audience. So, so identifying and analyzing the rhetorical situation is a great step as you dig deeper and go beyond summary and start analyzing the piece you're critically reading. Um, another great thing is identifying patterns. So what are things you notice happening more than once? Maybe a word or an idea that is repeated or emphasized by the author. And when we go through our example on the next slide, I'll go into a little more detail talking about specific types of patterns, particularly key concepts and keywords. Um, this is a really great strategy um, you can do while annotating. So if you see words repeated multiple times and there may be new words to you or words that are used a little bit differently than how we typically understand them, highlight those and, and look them up or figure out what they mean in terms of how the author is using them and and use that as a way to kind of decode, if you will, what the article is communicating. Analyzing the argument. So I think anytime we read something critically, we have to answer the questions, what is the author saying? What message are they communicating? Why are they doing this? And most importantly, ultimately, do I agree or not and why? And we, we really talked about this with rhetorical analysis last time. So you can see how now we're applying that strategy to a specific case of reading an article or watching a video or something we're reading with purpose and our purpose is to, to understand and, and see how the author might be trying to persuade us and then engage with that. Do we agree or not? Um, one way to do this is to play a game called the believing and doubting game. So do I believe this article or not? And, and one way to really take some time and, and mentally try to engage with that is to say, okay, what proof does the author have? Like essentially try to go through and prove the author's argument. And similarly with doubting, go through and try to disprove the author's argument. And if you do both believing and doubting, and look at the evidence and play that tape to the end for both directions, you'll have such a deeper understanding of the piece and be able to have a better conclusion about ultimately whether you agree or disagree. So you can believe or doubt the thing you're reading, um, but if you try to do both and play the tape to the end and then come back and make your decision, you'll have a much stronger, more critically informed decision. Um, finally, the last thing I'll mention is considering the larger context. No one writes anything in a vacuum. For instance, if you write a piece right now, you got to consider or read a piece right now, you got to consider that it was produced, you know, during a global pandemic. That's going to influence the author in some way, even if that's not the main subject of the piece. So consider the context in which the work was produced because that is inevitably going to have some influence on it. This goes back to what I said in the first lecture about how culture influences writers. And writers have power to create change to influence culture, but when we're examining and understanding their works or examining ourselves and our motives for writing and creating and producing, we, we can't neglect the cultural influences that have influenced us. So these are the strategies I have for you for critical reading. Uh, hopefully you find them helpful as you read uh, more challenging and complex pieces, both in this class and other classes. We're going to move on to part two of the lecture and look at how to do this, these things with a specific example. Sam Anderson's just one more game.